Our next speaker is Jose Almos or Joey. Uh, he's currently a postdoc in the Fraser Lab, um, but was before this a graduate student at Rice University and a uh, longtime supporter of the education programs for BioExpo. Today he'll be talking about macromolecular crystallization techniques. So we'll focus more on the practical aspects, but there will be some overlap um, because we do need to talk about the theory behind some of this um, in the interest of keeping this as a, a separate recording. So. Joey, I'll let you take it from here. Cool. Well, thanks, Bill. Yeah, so I'm Joey. Um, there will be significant overlap between our talks. I thought Diana's talk might be a little more theory heavy, uh, so hopefully that's okay. I saw that some folks joined in who weren't here for Diana's talk, so maybe that'll be useful to some of them. Um, but uh, here we go. Cool. Okay, so right, in conventional X-ray crystallography, um, the principle here is that we are coercing our protein molecules to form this 3D uh, array uh, su such that we could uh, uh, illuminate it with a focused intense X-ray beam uh, and then rotate it through the X-ray beam, collect uh, reflections, and then using Fourier transforms, convert this into a 3D electron density map, which is sort of this blue mesh that you're seeing on the figure below, uh, and using that data, uh, build in a model, which is uh, the yellow stick. Uh, model that you're seeing, which is probably what you're more familiar with, with seeing in primary literature and also in textbooks. Uh, of course, the advantage of X-ray crystallography is that purely as a function of all of the available structures, it, it remains the highest resolution uh, technique. You can often reach near atomic resolution with, with crystals, uh, but of course it does come with some disadvantages. Uh, BioExo is interested in studying uh, protein dynamics, but it, but it is true that crystals can, can uh, limit the dynamics that can be investigated. You might imagine that if the active site of an enzyme you're interested in uh, is involved in uh, crystal contacts or is proximal to a neighboring molecule, it might uh, it, it might inhibit any any kind of motions that are required for catalysis uh, or sort of other com uh, conformational sampling. Uh, and so the crystal lattice has to be able to uh, withstand any any motions or changes uh, in order for you to observe them. Uh, X-rays can obviously damage proteins, uh, and there's like a limited amount of uh, radiation that you can expose crystals to before uh, they're trashed. Uh, and so this is why we conventionally carry out macromolecular crystallography experiments under a liquid nitrogen stream to sort of prolong the life of the crystal uh, and then how much data you can collect from them. And you need relatively large crystals for these experiments. You know, 20 microns isn't that large in every dimension. Uh, neutron crystallography requires on the order of millimeter crystals, so it's not too bad. Okay. So just looking at uh, some of the PDB statistics from 2019, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that X-ray crystallography has, has sort of been the workhorse of, of structural biology for a long time. So you know, here in 2019, there were over 130,000 structures contributed by X-ray crystallography. But of course, there are other productive structural methods. Um, so nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR, contrib contributed uh, upwards of 12,000 structures. And then cryo-electron microscopy, uh, or electron microscopy has also contri uh, contributed thousands of structures. And I'm sure you all are familiar with uh, the resolution revolution that that field is, is undergoing and uh, the single particle cryium work that's uh, quickly gaining ground and, and, and being really productive for, for structural uh, biology. Okay. And again, so just, uh, just to review sort of the, the crystallographic workflow. Uh, you, you, in order to generate protein crystals, you need to start with a very homogeneous and pure sample. Uh, fortunately, we can now employ things like cell culture, and molecular biology um, to sort of do this in bacteria uh, or, or other um, cells. Uh, and we no longer have to, for example, harvest protein like myoglobin from sperm whales the way that crystallographers used to in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but effectively, once you've generated a homogeneous, monodispersed, a uh, pure sample, you can, you can generate your protein crystals, use those crystals to uh, sample reciprocal space uh, and collect your Bragg peaks on a detector. We no longer really use film for those things, you know it's here. Uh, and then having collected uh, your rotational data, uh, you can carry out some mathematical analyses and Fourier transforms to generate uh, electron density maps and then uh, structure refinements to generate your final models for deposition into the protein data bank. And so, what is a crystal? I think the most relatable example for everyone is table salt, right? And so, um, you know, these these uh, crystals 
are quite different from protein crystals. They are uh, held together by strong ionic interactions, um, whereas protein crystals, as Diana mentioned, uh, involve these sparse, weak uh, intermolecular um, interactions. Uh, but because they have such sparse, weak intermolecular uh, interactions, you can um, sort of leverage those solvent channels within the protein crystal, right? So you'll, you'll recall that Diana said, the, uh, on average, crystals are 30 to 70% solvent content. Uh, so these are fully hydrated, um, usually. Uh, you can use these solvent channels for the diffusion of small molecules, ligands, uh, and drugs, and, and other things. So you might imagine that if you've solved the structure uh, in the APO form or without a ligand bound, uh, you could then maybe use the same crystal form, hope its isomorphism doesn't uh, change upon binding, and then solve that structure as well for, for a comparison. Um, but yes, these are very different crystals. If you were to you know, try to crush a salt crystal with a spoon, you would meet some resistance and uh, it, it would sort of grind. If you tried to probe a protein crystal, it, it, you, you would destroy it. So, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Okay, and so how do you go about making a protein crystal? Well, the idea is that you have to just search through a broad parameter space um, of many different crystal, uh, crystallization conditions that have been productive before. Uh, and, you, and as Diana, uh, explained, you want to push your protein solution into the super saturation state where you can have a uh, nucleation events and move into the sort of metastable zone where uh, your crystal slowly grows over time. But it is a trial and error approach. So you're just doing core screening across many different conditions to identify initial hits, sort of like whispers of crystals uh, that you can then follow up with some of the techniques that I'm about to go into uh, for optimization around those conditions, right? So most, most, um, Precipitin solutions include um, a, bu a, buf a buffer, sorry, a, uh, buffer pH, um, salts, um, molecular weight pegs and stuff. And so you can vary those conditions uh, to generate your crystals. Okay. And so here's an example of two different companies that, um, that sell these sorts of kits. Um, so Hampton Research is um, one of the largest crystallography companies and actually their website is well worth visiting because they actually have a crystallography 101 section that I think many of you will find helpful with uh, PDFs of, of useful information. So I've included a link at the end of the talk. Um, as you might expect, many of these kits will have overlap in the crystal, uh, crystallization conditions that they explore, uh, but this can also be helpful, right? Um, because you might start to observe trends and you might think, oh, PEG3350 really is the, the workhorse here. And so then you just work around that space and, uh, or you might see some trends in the types of salts that are uh, precipitating your protein solution and, and, and that sort of thing. Some of them are purpose um, built, I guess I, I would say. So some of them are sort of designed in such a way that they might facilitate uh, crystallization of membrane proteins or protein complexes or protein DNA complexes. Uh, some of them are designed a step further and already have cryoprotectants built into them, right? So you might imagine that um, something like 30% PEG 350 or something uh, is, is already going to prevent uh, some of that ice ring formation that Diana mentioned you don't want because uh, it can be detrimental to your uh, data collection and data analysis, not always, but often. Um, so that's pretty cool. And these are worth exploring for sure. Um, okay. And so Broadly speaking, there, there are five crystal, uh, crystallization methods that I will cover today. I would say that the vapor diffusion is uh, the most common method as it's more amenable to high throughput setups. And so the, the vapor diffusion experiments are the first three. Um, so you can have a, the classic experiment, which is this hanging drop vapor diffusion experiment uh, where you use a cover slip. Also, can you see my pointer, Bill? Yes, we can see right, it. Cool. All right, so you have uh, a cover slip, uh, which sits on top <clears throat> of your well, um, and, and sort of water diffuses out to reach equilibrium and precipitate out your, your, your protein. Uh, you could have a similar setup with a micro bridge inside the well that uh, has an indentation that allows for your uh, protein solution to sit in. You could have this micro batch under oil setup, which is uh, something Dr. Bowman will speak about later, because I think this is, if I'm correct, what HWI employs in their a high throughput setup. And so the idea here is that um, you would have a, a, a tray with uh, an oil layer on it, you know, like 30, 30, uh, three millimeters thick or thick enough to cover the indentation. And then you would place your precipitant solution at the bottom of that and, and layer your protein on top. And so there's not as much 
uh, a diffusion, but there, there is some diffusion going on. You can see how that's uh, delineated here, but um, basically those things are immersed together under oil. Uh, you can have microdialysis where you can use buttons or tubing and clips to sort of set up your protein solution with, with the precipitin solution and allow for uh, dialysis across the membrane tubing. This is advantageous in some ways because you can swap out the solutions and replenish stuff and try new things if you haven't um, destroyed your, your, your protein sample. But again, because of the nature of, of that setup, it's not really conducive to high throughput screening. And because you have to work through so many different commercial screens, um, this, is, this isn't like a commonly employed technique. And then of course, there's the free interface diffusion method, which someone had a question about earlier. And I would say that this is the most, uh, the, the, the technique that I employed the most during my thesis work, uh, simply because XFL work uh, requires many, many, many small crystals. Uh, and so it's just the, the easiest way for us uh, to do that for the samples that we were investigating. Um, and so no matter which technique you use here, the basic principle is the same. You wanna subject your protein to a chemical environment or a parameter space that involves you know, temperature, pH, concentration, that sort of thing um, that uh, sort of forces it to come together and form this continuous lattice in, in a more desirable uh, energetic configuration, such as the one shown here in the bottom, um, which is highlighting a crystal and, and showing how that, how that looks. Okay, and so before I go into some of the demos that we're gonna look at today, I just wanna upfront acknowledge that this is coming off of the Journal of Visualized Experiments. Um, I consider going in and recording these myself, but uh, it's actually pretty well documented and detailed. So uh, feel free to visit this journal article for further details later. Um, unfortunately, we're not in person, otherwise we would be setting up these experiments together. Uh, but Hampton Research does sell a Lysozyme kit for like $150. So if you were really ambitious and wanted to, to try that, you're welcome to. Okay, so the first um, experimental setup I'm gonna show you guys here is the hanging drop setup. And so on the top left, you can see that we have this 24 well plate. It has these uh, pre-greased wells with sil silicon grease around it. Um, they also sell them without silicon grease, which is the type of tray that this scientist is going to use for his ex uh, experiment for their experiment. And you're going to see how um, how they set that up. These trays are not the type of trays that you would really want to use for uh, working through that coarse uh, grain screening. This is sort of when you're fine tuning. So if you look at this setup at the bottom, you can see that they're modulating pH top down. So it starts 4, 4.3, 4.6, 4.9. And then across, uh, they're varying salt, right? So they're working sort of in that two variable uh, parameter space that Diana described earlier. Okay. And so I'll just narrate this video for, for you guys since we can't do this in person. Um, and so you can see here that the scientist has already prepared all of the individual solutions that they require for their tray and they're now filling the reservoir uh, solution. So this is the, what, what sits at the bottom of the well. Now they're pre-greasing their uh, wells with that silicon grease. You sort of wanna do it in such a way that you leave a, an opening um, for air escape when you seal it. And here are the cover slips that you would use. These come in different sizes. Uh, these are probably the 18 millimeter ones. You can see that they're using an air can to dust off any particulates or dust or, or any other contaminants that might otherwise interfere with your uh, crystallization experiment. And that's, that's uh, useful to do because it can be pretty disheartening if you look at your tray and you think you have a hit and it's, it's not because it's a, you know, a fiber of some sort that's contaminating it. So after you dust that off, you would set it on the edge of, oh, well, we're going to get there in the next frame. But uh, what's going to happen in this experiment um, is that the scientist is going to combine the protein and precipitin on the cover slip for equilibration with the reservoir solution by inverting it. And there, um, you can also modulate protein concentration at this stage, right? So if you set it up one to one, um, uh, so you, would, you would sort of reach equilibration uh, and have uh, an experiment going there. But if, if you wanted to take up the protein concentration, uh, you, you could just do two microliters of protein, one microliter of precipitant, right? And you would effectively concentrate that uh, in the diffusion experiment. And then if you're worried that you're seeing too much aggregation or um, heavy precipitate, uh, 
then you could also take it down and, and, and reduce that ratio. Um, I'll also say that even though in the video, the scientist is only setting up one drop per well, uh, you, you can definitely do more than that. It's not uncommon to do two or three. Um, and you know, the volume difference is uh, very significant. The drops here are on the order of one to two microliters, whereas the reservoir solution is either 500 or 1,000 microliters. Um, so you're not worried that they're competing or anything. Okay, and so now they're taking their protein solution um, and putting it on uh, the cover slip here. Um, you kind of want to avoid air bubbles anytime you're working with protein. Proteins like being hydrated and so they don't like air water interfaces. So you would take the reservoir solution that corresponds to the well that you're trying to seal, combine it with the protein, gently mix it together. Again, being careful not to introduce air bubbles. Um, and then basically you would use uh, tweezers or forceps to gently uh, pick up the cover slip, invert it, and place it on the tray. You want to do this directionally also. Um, you might imagine that if you just layer it on top, like a sandwich, you're going to get uneven sealing. And then if it's exposed to the environment, you won't, that you're going to lose that experiment, right? You won't, each, each of these drops is an individual experiment. But if this is open to the environment, then you're no longer, uh, you no longer have that controlled diffusion. Uh, so if you do it in this way, in, in this way where you set it down on one side and then gently push it the other way um, towards that open crevice, then it'll seal um, much more nicely. And take my word for it, I've done it both ways. Uh, let's see, what else is left in this one? Yeah, and you just want to be super gentle. Um, those stainless steel tweezers can really, really easily crush that uh, cover slip and break it. I've also done that a bunch. Um, and it's really important to make some initial notes off of the, the screen when you set it up, you can find, you will find that some drops will be clear. Um, some drops might show some light precipitation already. Some of them uh, might phase separate, but this is why you take detailed notes. And then you would set it down in, an inc in a temperature controlled incubator. Even if you're doing room temperature, it's a good idea to avoid fluctuations because uh, crystals are fragile and very um, susceptible to environmental changes. And so, you know, if it's room temperature 20 degrees C, which is the most productive uh, crystallization temperature employed, I would say, uh, is what you would use, but uh, four degrees is very commonly used too. All right. And here, what we're going to look at, oops, sorry. Okay, here, what we're going to look at is a sitting drop setup. So it's very, very similar um, in setup, except that now we have this micro bridge that I, that I explained earlier. Uh, and so you basically set these inside those 24 well plates, the micro bridge. Uh, and then you do the exact same uh, thing. Um, and this here is an example of another tray. This is a 96 well uh, tray that has two sitting drop indentations and then a reservoir solution next to it. So each of these uh, wells is its own individual experiment. Okay. So if we work through this video, um, oh, okay. so here's, here's that setup, right? After you mix them, that water diffuses out of your drop and you reach the super saturation stage for nucleation. Um, cool. Yeah, so you would fill the well on the side, underneath the, the micro bridge or you know, next to it with your precipitant solution, 500 microliters of, of that buffer and salt component. And then you would take your uh, protein, in this case, lysozyme from your tube, put it on the drop, then gent gently take a microliter from the precipitate solution and do the same, gently mix it. Um, and for these, uh, you can also use uh, the, the glass cover slips that, that were shown earlier, but it's pretty common to use uh, tape and you wanna be sure you use optically transparent tape uh, so that when you go into image your um, samples with um, like a UV fluorescence or UV excitation, triple line excitation microscope, you, you can still see your signal. And it's not, it's not uh, obstructed by whatever tape you're using to seal your drop. Okay. And then uh, the micro batch method uh, involves the use of, of, of an oil uh, layer, right? And so you'll, you'll see here, um, one sec. Okay, you'll see here that they're uh, dusting off uh, the tray as well to make sure that there are no contaminants or particulates. Now they're layering on 
some 100% paraffin oil. You kind of want to make sure that it's filled up and then gently pull off um, sort of the excess oil and leave that thin layer such that the indentations are underneath it. And then, as I said before, you would uh, gently place the precipitin at the very bottom of the drop and then layer, layer the protein uh, directly into it. And th these would uh, sort of, um, you know, sit under the oil with minimal diffusion. Uh, and you would monitor them in the same way, take the same kind of notes. And this is the crystal, crystallization technique that's used for uh, the Hotman Woodwork Institute um, Crystallization Center that Dr. Bowman will speak about in her talk. Okay. Uh, the free interface diffusion method was one of the other techniques that I mentioned. Um, histor historically, free interface diffusion crystallization has meant that you would take a, a, a capillary la layer in precipitant on one end that's wax sealed and layer in protein on top of that, such that you create an interface between protein and precipitant that would diffuse over time. Uh, and in that, in that process, over time, you would generate uh, crystals as, as you traverse that um, concentration gradient, as, as someone asked during the talk earlier. Um, however, because the nature of XFOL experiments is such that you need you know, upwards of multiple grams of protein to, to carry out some data collection, uh, often, depending on what your experimental goals are, not always. Um, another, another way we do free interface diffusion crystallization experiments is inside microcentrifuge tubes. Um, and so you might imagine that you could layer um, the precipitant solution sort of on the bottom of the tube and then really gently uh, place your protein on top. And that would uh, create an interface with you know, a, a density gradient. And as your crystals grow over time, they would sediment and fall out of solution. And so that's also advantageous to us for XFL experiments because we want to be working with very small crystals in contrast to macromolecular uh, conventional crystallography. Um, and this can be modulated further. So um, you can also sort of push the, the gradient a little bit through centrifugation. And so that's what's being shown on, on panel C here. Um, can, you can modulate it even further if you set up a free interface diffusion experiment like in a glass file. Uh, you could you could throw in a stir bar, a very small stir bar, uh, and then sort of continuously stir your crystallization condition. Um, and that's actually what I ended up doing for the bulk of my thesis work because it really helped limit uh, the size of the crystals that grew. Uh, if we sort of did it without stirring, uh, the crystals would just grow indefinitely in the microcentrifuge tube, and that wasn't very useful for us. Um, so yeah, this is the free interface diffusion method, which is commonly used in the center. All right, and then <laughs> if you're lucky or if you're using Liza's I am like the scientists who um, wrote up this research article uh, for Injo, you would see some crystals. Liza's I am, if you even look at it, it'll crystallize. Um, and so that's sort of why we have this nice example in, in video form. And if you are lucky enough to see some crystals like these, it'll be pretty obvious that they're crystal. I mean, these are Biofringent, right? So protein crystals are chiral, and um, they you, you can use a polarized light to to see to to observe that biofringence within your protein crystal. Uh, however, you will see a lot of different um, forms of precipitant and aggregation within your drops. And so I'm just going through some samples here. Uh, some of them would be clear, right? So you might give that a, a low score of zero or one, or it's still ongoing, but it's not uh, it's not yet precipitated or dead or Maybe it's too dilute and you need to take up your protein or precipitant concentrations, as Diana explained. Um, this is just a bad drop. Like sometimes if you're using a pipetting robot, it's poorly calibrated or one of them misses. Uh, and so, you know, this is, isn't really going to go anywhere. Um, heavy precipitants, generally not super productive. Sometimes light precipitants can be. Um, you can get phase separation from some of those oils in the kits. Um, another really annoying thing um, there's not really a good example of that here, but is when you generate a protein skin. So sometimes you'll have these beautiful crystals uh, within your well, but they're sort of, you know, uh, kept from you by this layer uh, of a protein film on top of that, um, which is really unfortunate. Um, but oftentimes you can use a crystal probe to gently remove the layer. And if your crystals aren't embedded in the layer, then uh, you're still in business. But um, that's another likely outcome. Um, you can have a lot of different crystal morphologies, of course, and some of them are 
quite uh, quite annoying to harvest. You know, if they're sort of twinned and growing together, they can be quite annoying. Um, if they're needles, you might have to get really creative with your data collection and, you know, uh, collect X-ray data in this helical approach because <laughs> it's, you know, this thin crystal. Um, so just, uh, you can't really control for morphology very well, but um, you can have many different outcomes. And so if you're looking at your trays and you're observing them, it's been a couple of days or a few days since you've set up your trays, how might you go about confirming that you have a protein crystal, right? And so <laughs> if you're brave and you have a lot of like nice crystals such as the, the person did in the, uh, the video that I showed earlier, you can actually probe them. Uh, I recommend this. I did it when I first joined the crystallography lab and uh, it, it really gave me an appreciation for all of these things, right? Like when someone tells me protein crystals are 50% uh, hydrated, I'm like, I, I know what that feels like. Uh, and I, like uh, if, you, if you probe them, they, they almost just drift into solution. Um, you, you, you don't find that you, you meet resistance. Uh, you can also use dyes. So, right, you might imagine that some false positive crystals, um, such as salts or other uh, mo precipitant molecules, uh, can also form uh, crystals in the super saturation stage. Um, however, because because uh, they are small molecules, things like is it dye won't diffuse into it, right? Um, however, protein crystals, which have these large solvent channel cavities, can readily take up um, sort of small molecules. And and you can see here that these are protein crystals confirmed um, by by that is it dye, which which is colored the the protein crystals. I will say that both of these approaches are no, no longer really used. They're, they're sort of uh, antiquated, right? Because they're pretty damaging to your sample. Um, a bright field microscope is the conventional light microscope that you would use for um, sort of observing these things um, and then deciding what you might want to, for example, look at under uh, cross-polarized uh, microscopes or even uh, a UV fluorescence microscope. So you can actually exploit the tryptophan amino acids within your sample um, for uh, to excite them and then generate this white signal on a black background. And that, that sort of confirms that you're seeing, or it can confirm that you're seeing um, a protein crystal. It's, it, you can also obtain false positives from, from this detection method. Um, there's also Sonic, which um, Diana spoke to also. Um, this is sort of the least, or the, the approach that will result in the least false positives, um, but it is pretty, uh, pricey and specialized, um, so not there. They aren't there aren't very many uh, sonic instruments sort of available to crystallography labs. Okay, and then Diana Diana mentioned this too. But um, suppose that you had a crystal hit that was really nice and gave you some nice crystals, and for whatever reason you're doing everything the same, purifying your pressing the same, using the same crystallization stocks. You're you're simply not uh, seeing any any uh, reproduction of your crystallization. You can use things like a seeding tool um, shown here to sort of um, cross-contaminate. So you can take a small amount of your crystalline sample from your first condition setup and then introduce a streak through your new drop that hasn't, uh, that hasn't uh, been producing crystals and they will actually grow uh, along the the streak, which is kind of cool, which is what you're seeing here. Um, so this is sort of the seed streaking approach that that uh, Diana mentioned earlier. Um, and of course, it induces nucleation in the new drop uh, because you're introducing microcrystals from the initial setup. Uh, another approach that I think can be useful is uh, this idea of microseed matrix screening. Um, some people have different thoughts about this, but in our lab, uh, in my thesis lab, when we were working on conventional crystallography experiments, we found this pretty uh, helpful. So the idea here in contrast to seed streaking or sort of conventional streaking is that rather than taking an initial crystallization condition and, and using those seeds in the same condition, you would take a seed stock, dilute it, introduce it to your protein, and then set up some trays into unrelated conditions. And so then let's say that uh, the ammonium phosphate didn't previously give you any uh, crystal hits, introducing um, these seeds for nucleation sites in your in your core screens uh, can actually generate um, crystals oftentimes that are useful. Uh, and, and as you can see in this first column, it can improve your crystal size quite nicely. Um, as you can see here, this is iterative um, 
MMS. So if you take your seed stock and iteratively dilute it, right? If you have too many seeds, you have too many nucleation events, you get too many small crystals and not enough growth. Uh, and so if you diluted it, if you carry out a dilution series, you can get into that nice sweet spot, which is what you want with these large uh, chunky crystals. Uh, not only can it improve your crystal size for data collection, you can also change the morphology, which is kind of cool. So like if you have these annoying needle clusters that aren't very useful or helpful for data collection and you introduce some seeds into, into related conditions, uh, you can actually generate these, these uh, plate-like uh, crystals, which is pretty cool. Uh, and in order to generate seeds, uh, you have to use seed beads, which is cringy at first because you know you're trying to grow <laughs> large crystals, so it can be kind of hurtful for someone to suggest that you should break apart your crystals. I think, uh, but you could use this glass probe to smash them, or different sized, uh, like either stainless steel or glass um, beads, to sort of place them into um, a microcentrifuge tube with your crystals and then vortex them. Um, and, and you know you just want to be careful about not overheating your samples. Sonication can often do that. Um, so you want to gently uh, sort of pulse it to generate your seeds. Um, and and there, there's a link to this article um, in, in my references. And so I think this technique is worthwhile for difficult targets or things that are uh, proving difficult to reproduce. OK. And then without going into too much detail, because I, I know Diana will Sorry, not Diana. Dr. Bone will cover um, a lot of the high throughput instruments available through the Hotman Woodware Institute. Um, I, I explained to you all that when you're starting out with these crystallographic vapor diffusion experimental setups, if you don't have a good starting point, either from the literature or sort of the biochemistry of your protein and the thermostability uh, parameters that you know about it, um, you just have to work through a bunch of different conditions. And you all have seen what that looks like by hand. So you might imagine that you know one commercial screen you want to set up at one protein concentration. You might want to also set it up with a ligand. You might want to set it up with a different buffer. And so like it it, it can get incredibly complicated quite quickly um, or numerous. I guess you can get a lot of conditions. And so we employ liquid handling robots for this. Uh, these are also advantageous because they help with reproducibility, right? Um, ideally, the robots are well calibrated and will um, serve pipette in exactly the same fashion every single time. Uh, as, as we've discussed, humidity is really important, and mosquitoes can often have these humidity chambers. You can sort of see the nebulizer in the back that's connected to it. Uh, and so this is closed off, and, it, and you can maintain a constant um, hum, uh, humidity chamber around it. Um, but the idea behind this robot is that um, there are these tips here that are disposable that give it the name mosquito, right? So it has this um, sort of retractable um, plastic sheath that allows the robot to pipette down uh, down to 100 nanoliters of protein sample into your 96 well plates here, right? And so that's wonderful because, as Diana said, sometimes you spend months and months purifying proteins, right? And you want to get the most bang for your buck. And so if you're setting up one to two microliter drops by hand, you're, work you're using a lot of protein. Um, but these robots can use 100 or 200 nanoliters, and, and that's super advantageous. Um, and, and again, same, same principle here. You want to be sure you always use optical tape to seal your trace to make sure that you get um, that, that UV signal through. And yeah, these robots can do uh, all, all forms of the vapor diffusion experiments, sitting, hanging, um, and microbatch. OK, and of course, if, you, if you've decided that you're going to carry out, uh, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of crystallographic, crystallographic uh, experiments uh, and set up like 30 trays. You also need to monitor them in a high throughput fashion. And you know, you're not going to sit at a microscope and do that individually, probably. So many crystallogra crystallographic cores have uh, imagers. Uh, here at UCSF, we have a uh, Formulatrix rock imager. And we have one that sits at room temperature, which is this one at uh, 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, and you can see to the right of it, there's a computer. So you basically have a barcode for your plate scan it in, put it in there. And this automatically takes images for you uh, periodically. And you can actually sit at the comfort of your desk with your coffee and, and, and look through the images. It'll actually, it'll actually try to score them for you and tell you what it thinks they are. But you know, it's, it's a robot. And sometimes you're not in the right focal plane um, for your drop. And so you might need to go in and ind individually expect, inspect some drops. 
Um, you can also go in and individually collect some UV images for drops that you think are, are fruitful, but um, the robots are, or the images are nice because they also um, save you a lot of uh, time and money, right? So, uh, there, so in, in addition to the imager and the mosquito, um, we have this dragonfly um, liquid handling robot. And so after you've sort of worked through all of those different commercially available screens and you've decided that you want to work around um, ammonium sulfate or, or some other salt, uh, you can generate some stock solutions at high molarity uh, and then supply these to the dragonfly um, basically here uh, and then give it also your 96 well plate and then compute sort of what kind of gradient you want for that ammonium phosphate or sulfate or whatever you're using. Um, and, and depending on what pH your solution is at, you can generate basically your own commercial screen using robots, which is really cool. Okay. And then one other thing I wanted to mention was, you know, if your crystals are diffracting poorly, can they be improved? And, and Diana touched on this, but there are many different additive screens that can also be used. Um, if, if you know seeding isn't working to generate better crystals, there are things like silver bullets that are sort of, uh, they can be metal ions, polydentate ligands, other salts, detergents, um, metabolic extracts, th things that basically work to reinforce uh, either your protein stability or those crystal contacts. Uh, you can actually see those in the structures, which, in some of the structures, which is pretty cool. You can see how they're exactly cross-linking, um, or not cross-linking, but um, interacting with um, the neighboring molecules. But uh, I would also caution that diffraction is always the ultimate test, as, as Diana mentioned. Uh, ugly crystals can diffract beautifully, and beautiful crystals can really lead you astray. Uh, so, you know, don't, don't chase crystals solely off of uh, their appearance. I think uh, it can be incredibly mis misleading. If you're unsure and your crystals are too small to collect a couple of images for, um, we won't get into it in my presentation, but there are things like powder diffraction where you can sort of harvest your crystals, pack them into a glass capillary, and then uh, illuminate that um, with x-rays and, and get an idea for whether the unit cell dimensions that you are observing might correspond to a small molecule that's tightly packed or uh, a larger um, crystal lattice, basically. Okay, and then another cool robot that I wanted to show you guys that's available here at UCSF, um, because it's important to the crystal harvesting, is this uh, NANUC. So uh, ahead of data collection um, at a synchrotron, you, you want to sort of rapidly freeze uh, your crystal in liquid nitrogen um, quickly enough that you prevent ice formation and, and reduce the amount of mosaicity you're seeing, right? So mosaicity meaning how imperfect your crystal is or how disordered it is. Again, like pr protein crystals are, are uh, my, my PhD advisor likes to say that they breathe, like they kind of fluctuate a little bit, which, you know, um, he, he never mentioned the time scale, but, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it is happening. They're, they're quite dynamic. Uh, and so you want to do this really quickly. And the cool thing about this instrument is that uh, basically, you go under a microscope, uh, harvest your crystal into a loop, um, and then transfer it onto the robot. The robot then really quickly, uh, you know, at two meters per second, plunges that into uh, your doer in liquid nitrogen. Um, and, and basically, the, your doer is within, within the instrument, uh, and there's a stream of nitrogen gas uh, over the internal liquid nitrogen doer so that you're not really slowly moving through that. Um, because again, ice rings can, uh, can be detrimental to your experiment. Um, and there are also other reasons that you would want to rapidly cool your sample. Uh, it, it'll reduce the amount of cooling induced conformational changes, right? So protein structures are of course temperature dependent. Um, and so if you rapidly quick, uh, if you rapidly freeze it, then you're not going to get this like broad spread of, of, um, of structures. Another thing is that sometimes you can get ligand ejection. So if there are like things binding the surface of your protein that you might be interested in because they have biological relevance. When you cool it, it, it might actually eject them. So it's best to do it as quickly um, as possible. The other adva advantage of this type of instrument is that uh, you, you don't run into um, the trouble of potentially like bumping your crystal into, uh, into the puck, which can happen, right? Um, and, and so that's sad because you can lose your sample. Okay. And yeah, if you have crystals and you harvest them, then you're off to the races. And 
our lab is a little bit intense at UCSF. And here's uh, Galen, who's one of the postdocs in our group that's been doing some pretty serious high throughput structural screening um, sort of related to the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic. And so here's an example of a bunch of the pins that he uses for, for those kinds of experiments. Uh, these are the pucks that are within that robot that, that uh, enclose those, those loops. This entire thing, this entire cylinder would sit within a doer in here that's charged with liquid nitrogen. These things are kept cool. Uh, at UCSF, the person with the most crystals has to drive the doers across the Bay Bridge. So we have terrible weather in San Francisco, as you can see here. And you would uh, have to go across the Bay to the advanced light source, take your crystals, and then hopefully get some nice diffraction as shown by uh, this pattern from Galen here. Um, and that's basically all I wanted to cover. Um, but I also wanted to end by giving a shout out to one of our attendees. Uh, I'm really proud of Gabby, uh, who's a University of Puerto Rico Maya West student and just recently received the Barry Goldwater Scholarship. Congratulations, Gabby. Uh, I'm really proud of Gabby because she's someone uh, who really uh, takes, it, takes it upon herself to take initiatives uh, and seek opportunities. And, and I, I really appreciate how she works to build community among her peers. And she was an integral member at Rice for the last summer cohort that I mentored, um, who, who was really, you know, helpful to her, to her peers and, and just work to make it a, a collaborative environment. Um, and, and, you know, I think Gabby's pretty happy with the trajectory she's on uh, in, in science and, and what she wants to do with her career. And so, you know, I'd encourage many of you who are also here from the University of Puerto Rico to seek out those opportunities. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. And, you know, science, like Christos, stands on the shoulder of, shoulders of giants and we all incrementally build on, on the things that we've learned. Uh, okay, and then yeah, here are all those resources that I mentioned during my talk uh, that you, that you all should definitely visit because uh, that'll be really helpful. In particular, this overview of bio biological macro molecule crystallization article um, really goes into detail about the things that I covered, but also the theory that Diana covered and some of the things that um, Bill and, and Dr. Bowman will cover. Um, but it's all here, and all of these are super helpful to you all. Uh, I'm fluent in Spanish, but I learned all of my science in English. And so this website in particular is kind of nice because you can get all sorts of um, lectures on crystallography in Spanish, which is cool. Um, you know, yeah, it's super helpful. I, I would visit that too. Um, and yeah, with that, I will take any questions.